Hi everyone, my name is James Reeves. Regulars may notice that I haven't shaved in a few weeks because I've been painstakingly researching this video for you. But unlike my facial hair, this video is not going to disappoint you. If you've been watching the channel for any length of time, you likely know I'm a huge AR-15 guy. I think that they're the best thing out there. AR-15s are accurate, more reliable than people give them credit for. They're easy to accessorize, easy to customize, easy to build really easy to shoot. It doesn't get better than the AR platform, at least for 223. However, from time to time, I get a little 556 five, curious. You guys know how it is. You get tired of coming home from work, seeing the same AR-15 propped up in the corner every day with the same look on its face. Not as exciting as when you first met it, and sometimes you catch yourself daydreaming at work thinking about sticking your trigger finger into something else. It's perfectly natural. And we're going to openly talk about these desires today as AR-15 men to AR-15 men. This video is going to discuss alternatives to the AR-15 that are 223 or 556 cal only. For those of you with drinking problems or incest-related mental defects, I may do an AK-47 alternative video in a few weeks. In the meantime, the AK guy should tide you over. So let's talk about the top five non-AR-15 223s and the pluses and minuses of each, kicking it off, of course, with number five. The Galil was created by the Israelis in the early 1970s to replace the FNFAL that the Israelis were using at the time. The FAL didn't perform very well in dusty, arid environments of the Middle East, and the Israelis noticed that the Kalashnikov pattern rifles used by their enemies in the region performed very well in the desert. But rather than merely adopting the AK-47, the Israelis set out to improve upon it. Essentially, they made a 223 caliber enhanced AK, and the Galil was born. It was a proven performer, light recoiling, although a little bit heavy at weighing nearly 10 pounds in many configurations. A Colt M4, by comparison, weighs only 6.5 pounds. So when the 2000s rolled around, IWI realized that the original Galil was a 20th century weapon that enhanced the AK, but shared many of its shortcomings as well. In addition to being heavy and almost all steel, it wasn't modular or easy to mount optics or accessories to. So at the turn of the millennium, IWI realized the Galil was getting a little dated, and in 2008, they introduced the modernized Galil Ace. The Ace, at its heart, retained many of the essential design elements of the original Galil, including a long strip piston operating system, which is, of course, the same proven, reliable system used by the AK-47. But instead of being made out of steel and wood, the Ace has integrated aluminum and polymer elements, including a polymer lower receiver you can see here, and a polymer stock. This cut the weight down to 7.5 pounds. The Ace was also made to be compatible with common, cheap aluminum or polymer M16 magazines instead of proprietary steel Galil magazines. Accuracy was also greatly improved with the Ace due to several factors. Optics mounting became easier with a full-length scope rail that runs along the top of the gun, as you can see here. The gas tube was separated from the receiver and dovetailed in place to reduce the impact of the gas piston on the gun's barrel. Better harmonics. Also, the Ace is equipped with a Galil sniper trigger. Because of this, the Ace can actually achieve sub-MOA accuracy. The Ace is more modular than the original Galil or the AK. In addition to adding a buttload of optic mounting space, the Ace has a railed handguard that would allow the end user to install lights, optical sighting systems, vertical foregrips, or a tack sack. Just this year, in 2021, IWI released the Gen 2 Ace, and we did a full video on that, comparing it against the Gen 1, if you want to check it out. But it was an even greater improvement, adding this M-Lock handguard that I absolutely love. So let's compare the pros and cons of the Ace versus the AR-15. The Ace is extremely well made in Israel. Fit and finish are fantastic. As mentioned, it employs the long stroke piston system borrowed from the AK-47, which many would argue as being more reliable than the direct impingement system used by the M16. The Ace also has an internal recoil spring, unlike the buffer spring in the stock tube of the AR-15. That means that you can use a folding stock with the Galil Ace, but not with the AR-15. 
the Gen 2 Ace ditched the Gen 1 Ace's proprietary stock, and now the folding stock tube will accept AR-15 stock bodies. Accuracy from the Ace is comparable to most high-end AR-15s. So the glial had a number of insanely tight groups for an AK derivative. The one you're looking at here is about 1.9 inches across with a little three-shot group that's uh, less than 0.5 inches, about 0.45 inches. All these benefits do come at a cost. The Ace is still going to be about a pound heavier than the AR-15, and perhaps the biggest downside is that the Galil Ace in 223 comes a little overgassed from the factory. While this leads to higher reliability, it also means more recoil, which is the opposite of what you want from a gun that's heavier, plus the gas isn't adjustable. The Ace is fairly modular, but nothing compares to the man's Barbie doll that is the AR-15, where parts availability is endless, and it's easy to change calibers, barrel lengths, and etc. at home, even if you're not a gunsmith. The AR-15 is generally less expensive, but the build quality of the Ace probably puts it at least in the same ballpark as premium AR-15s. MSRP on the Ace is still $1,900, and damn, that is a lot of shekels. Piston-fired guns are usually more expensive than direct impingement guns because of the more complex operating system that it uses. I've got two Aces personally, this is one of them, and I think that they are absolutely fantastic AR-15 alternatives. Moving on to number four, this is always the controversy slide because no one wants to lead in with a controversial pick and then viewers get pissed off if you put something that'll get them shook in the top three. One of TFB TV's most popular videos of all time is the eight reasons why the Mini-14 is better than the AR-15. I'm not saying that the Mini-14 is better than the AR-15, but there are at least a handful of arguments you can make as to why it could be. By the way, for the sake of clarity, I'm talking only about the newest generation of Mini-14. These all have a serial number prefix of 580 or higher. There were several technological advances that Ruger integrated, primarily aimed at increasing accuracy, pun, intended. Dude, just admit it. The Mini-14 is really a dope gun. You know it. I know it. Don't try to tell me it's a hunk of shit that's super inaccurate. Yeah, maybe back in the 1980s when porn cost money and the Mini-14 was kind of shitty. But now you all know that the Mini's got swag. So what is the Mini-14? Essentially, Ruger took the M14 and, well, mini it. It also takes some design cues from the M1 Grand and the M1 Carbine as well. It uses a self-cleaning fixed piston operating system that's very reliable and, at least in my experience, has been pretty clean to shoot with the suppressor, although your support hand will get a little bit dirty if it's in the vicinity of the gas block over here. Oh yeah, that's pretty cool. It's legal in all 50 states, even though it's pretty much just as capable as an AR-15. It's been around for 50 years now, and it's based on a design that's been around even longer. My experience with the Mini-14 has been that these are reliable, light recoiling guns that are easy to handle and relatively lightweight at just six and a half pounds with an 18 inch barrel. So it's the same weight as an M4, but with three and a half inches more barrel. They've got great triggers from the factory and they look just as classy as an M14 while handling like an M1 carbine. It's very easy to change the stock out on the Mini 14. You can keep the traditional classic wood sporting stock or you can use a folding stock, which is again, a plus over the AR-15. Sage even makes an EBR chassis for the Mini 14, if you can believe that. The Mini 14 is just plain fun but it can also be just plain business. What I mean by that is the Mini-14 has been adopted by numerous domestic and foreign government and law enforcement agencies across the globe, with even some military use. For example, the Rhodesian Bush War is strongly associated, of course, with the baby poop Rhodesian camo pattern FNFAL, but you may be surprised to find out that the Ruger Mini-14 was widely used in some capacity during the Rhodesian Bush War. I'm hoping that someone out there has a brushstroke camo mini. That would actually be kind of sick. The Mini-14 is probably the least expensive option on this list as well. A lot of AR-15 alternatives, especially ones that are piston-operated, tend to cost in excess of $1,500. 
even now when they're hard to come by, a Mini 14 can be had for less than a grand. Unlike pretty much every other semi-automatic rifle on the market today, you can actually get the Mini 14 in stainless steel, which is a huge plus if you're going to have it in a humid or salty marine environment. And the upcharge over blued steel is minimal. Finally, yes, you can get the A-Team style Ruger folding stock, which is, of course, completely rad and it's built on the original plans. So yeah, the Mini 14 kicks ass and I feel like I've adequately defended it here. It's usually beat by the AR-15 in the accuracy department and it's one of the well-known downsides of the Mini, but it's somewhat based on prior iterations of this gun. While the original Mini 14s are renowned for absolute dog shit accuracy, the newest Mini 14s can crank about two inch groups, which make them as accurate as most mid-tier AR-15s. This week, the best group we shot out of the Mini 30 was two and a half inches. Last week, I squeezed some two inch groups off of the bean bag. I even tested a Mini 14 against an AR-15 some time ago, and I squeezed a one inch five round group with 55 grain Eagle out shooting a budget AR-15. Look at that, guys. That's American Eagle. I shot two groups like this, just a tick over an inch. That's pretty incredible. On that note, you're kind of stuck with light 223, like 55 grain, because Ruger still uses that slower one in nine twist, while many AR-15 manufacturers have shifted to one in seven or one in eight twist, which can stabilize a greater range of 5.56 rounds. Optics mounting options are pretty pathetic too. In fact, I think the AK-47's got it beat there. If you try to put an optic here in the rear of the gun, it has only a little bit of rail, like two or three rail pieces in front of the ejection port. And if you put it anywhere right here, if it's too big of an optic, it'll actually interfere with the ejection of spent casings. I gotta move the EOTech. Now you can get it, you can remove the sight rail and install a couple of scope rings. So if you're using like an LPVO, it'll work just fine. But if you wanna mount anything towards the rear here, or if you wanna use the included scope mounting base, you're really gonna have to run it to see if it'll actually work and if it'll actually extract rounds with your optic in place. And that's kind of a pain in the ass. Speaking of kind of a pain in the ass, Try to find magazines for this thing. It's not impossible, but if you want to get decent quality first party magazines like that is Ruger, not dog shit like Pro Mags, you're going to spend two to three times as much as an AR-15 magazine and they're just going to be a little bit more difficult to find. So yeah, the Mini's not perfect, but I have to say that I pity the fool that doesn't consider the Mini as an option compared to an AR-15, especially if you're in a band state. Just get one. For number three, I have absolutely got to include the Zastava M85 or the Zastava M90. More or less, these are Serbian-made 223 AKs that are extremely high quality. I've reviewed both of them in detailed videos on TFB TV, and I'm proud to say that I own both of these excellent AKs. I bought them myself after I reviewed them. Does it feel wrong having a Kalashnikov pattern rifle in God and Eugene Stoner's caliber? that was invented specifically for the M16? Absolutely, I mean, it's goddamn blasphemy. But if it's wrong, I don't wanna be right. In 223, a properly tuned AK like the M90 has functionally zero recoil. The Zostava M85 is the short barreled version of this gun with a 10 inch barrel, roughly the same length as the Mark 18 AR-15 or M16 used by US Special Forces. The M90 here has an 18 inch barrel. The M85 and the M90 both use cold hammer forged chrome line barrels that are gonna last forever. Both of them are made in one of the oldest gun factories in the world in Serbia, and they're imported into White Plains, Illinois by Zastava USA. Both guns are high quality, especially for AKs. Not only do the Zastavas earn a spot on this list for their brilliant adaptation of the legendary AK-47 platform, but there's also a little bit of urgency here. As I've mentioned in previous videos, an anti-gun administration has the ability to ban these guns from being imported with the mere stroke of a pen. So this is one of the guns on the list 
that I would prioritize right now if you're thinking about getting one because they just started being imported in the country only a few weeks ago. It should be noted that Serbian AKs take what is called Yugo pattern furniture, which is different than conventional AK-47 or AK-74 furniture, but it's also not that hard to find. Magpul even makes this outstanding Zukov folding stock, which comes standard with the M90, and Hogue makes this great soft rubberized foregrip, which comes standard with the M90 as well. I got great accuracy with five shot groups at 100 yards with the M90 shooting from a bag. The best group of the day came from Ryan, who shot a 1.8 inch group with Pritvi Bardison 55 grain. We shot quite a few groups with Wolf Steel, and shockingly, with the 62 grain, I managed to squeeze a 2.5 MOA group from the cheapest 5.56 ammo money can buy. That is impressive. I would be pleased if I got that kind of accuracy out of an AR. These guns are smooth shooting, they're exemplary versions of the AK, and best of all, you can get them between $900 and $1,200 each, depending on how they come customized, which is pretty good for a top-end AK. The pros and cons are similar to what you saw with the Galil Ace. You're talking about a long-stroke piston AK-type rifle that's going to be heavier and maybe less accurate than an AR-15 in the same price range. Optics mounting options and accessories are going to be only slightly more difficult to obtain than the AR-15, so it's not really a huge issue, but I would never say that the AK would be able to compare with the AR for optic and accessory mounting, even though Zostava does make a really nice, I just got it in fact, and I reviewed this as part of my review, a really nice side rail scope mount for the M90. Another weak point of the 223 AK is that good magazines are hard to find and they're expensive when you do find them, while shitty 223 AK magazines are, well, shitty, but they're cheap. Fortunately, Zosta has fixed this. They make steel mags that are pretty good, but they're gonna run 40 or 50 bucks each and they're pretty heavy. Recently, Zostava, along with importing the M90, is now importing these polymer but partially steel reinforced 223 magazines that are pretty damn good. They're also lightweight and they're reasonably priced at around 20 to 25 bucks each, so that solves a big problem for the 223. You're talking about a premium AK that's going to have good customer service, adjustable gas, 18 inch barrel, $200 worth of furniture right out of the gate, 223, which isn't exactly the most common thing that you can find, threaded barrel. Oh, and we can't forget about that very un AK like accuracy that we got out of this gun. God, I don't even like AKs that much and I've got two on this list. What is this channel coming to? Number two is a rifle that's near and dear to my heart and more or less you probably all see it every Christmas too. You were probably expecting this gun to be on this list somewhere if you watched the channel before so it's no surprise that the Steyr AUG is the number two non-AR-15 platform 223. The AUG was invented in 1977 and was considered to be next level future shit back then, and it's still a state-of-the-art carbine as we sit here today. It uses a lightweight polymer chassis in a bullpup design, meaning that, as you see here, the magazine and the chamber are behind the trigger. Thus, the AUG can use a 16 to 20 inch barrel while being about the length of an MP5 submachine gun. That also means that all the weight's at the rear of this gun because most of the operating components are near the buttstock. It's because of this that one hand shooting is possible, even easy to do. The gun even handles like an SBR, a short barreled rifle, even though you get the long range ballistic performance of a longer gun, allowing you to make hits at 500 meters and well beyond. The gun uses a short stroke piston operating system, which is more sophisticated than the long stroke piston system from the AK, or the direct impingement from the AR. Unlike the AK, the short stroke piston in the AUG has multiple gas settings, so you can adjust the gas to optimize it for a suppressor to ensure reliability even after it's gotten dirty, or there's even a grenade launcher setting if you have one and you wanna be my new best friend. And even though it uses a piston operating system, it's only about seven to seven and a half pounds in most configurations. Build quality is of course Austrian, top notch, Accuracy, cold hammer forged barrels, fantastic. I can usually swing two MOA or better with most ammo. I did an in-depth video a year or two ago discussing the results of the extremely thorough and frankly, unnecessarily brutal torture test between the AUG and the M16 put on by the Australian government. The Aussies only recently declassified those test results and they reveal that the AUG performed better 
was more reliable in hostile environments, did better in mud testing, did better in sand testing, did better in water testing. It generated much less heat and it had a barrel life more than double that of the M16. And in the exact words of the Australian government, the AUG was significantly better than the M16. Their words, not mine. Obviously, they adopted it. But as far as drawbacks go, one of the main weak points of the AUG is the fact that the trigger sucks. Fortunately, if you merely replace the plastic sear with an aluminum sear, the trigger goes from abysmal to pretty damn good for less than a hundred bucks. Oh wow, yeah, that is, that's much better. That's really good for a bulldog. I like that a lot. That's crazy how what that one part does to change that. There's also a bit of a catch-22 with magazine compatibility with the AUG. The AUG takes proprietary magazines which are not that expensive or difficult to find, but essentially it doesn't take an M16 mag, and that's a strike against this gun. Now, fortunately, they do make a NATO receiver version, which is what I have here, and it actually accepts M16 and AR-15 magazines. The downside is that there's no bolt release. So while, for example, your last round bolt hold open will work, it goes empty, you take the magazine out, you put a new magazine in, you have to actually manually rack the charging handle. That makes reloading the NATO version a little bit slower and more complicated than reloading the standard AUG, which has a bolt release. And the standard AUG is already slower and more complicated than reloading an AR-15. Also, because this gun's a bullpup, you can see the ejection port is right next to your face, so there's no ambidexterity. If you switch, for example, to your left side, you will get smashed in the face by ejected brass. Really hard, ask me how I know. So yeah, the AUG's got a couple of downsides, but it's been heavily adopted by European military and police units, and it's easy to use, so easy to use, that even Australians have figured out how to do it with a measure of success, at least when they're sober. Finally, moving on to the number one. I thought long and hard about this one. A lot of you might get upset about it, but, it seems relatively clear to me that the winner is the FN SCAR. Just kidding, that gun's a piece of shit. In all seriousness, I think that the best 223 non-AR-15 is a true next generation weapon, and it in fact is one of three finalists for the next generation squad weapon solicitation by the US Armed Forces to replace the M16. And you know what? It could just win the whole thing. That gun is the SIG MCX. As I mentioned, at the time of filming this video, the MCX Spear is in the running to replace the M16, and it very well could. You all may remember my video that I recorded at SIG's headquarters in New Hampshire over a year ago where we talked at length about the MCX Spear and the advantages that it offers over the M16. Unlike the Styrog, the MCX does not completely eschew the M16 design. It keeps all the best features of the AR-15, and it redesigns aspects of the gun that aren't optimal. Basically, it fixes the weak points of the M16 platform. As I've mentioned several times in this video, the AR-15 is a direct impingement system. It uses a fixed gas tube that pushes gas from the barrel directly onto the gas key of the bolt carrier, and one criticism of this design is that the M16 shits where it eats. That is, it pushes unburned powder, debris, etc., back into the bolt carrier group and into the chamber, and it'll seize the gun up after a couple thousand rounds. Piston fire designs instead propel the gas into a gas tube with a piston designed handle fouling, meaning that piston designs tend to be more reliable after extended firing sessions without cleaning. The MCX uses a very efficient and easily adjustable short stroke piston system. The two copies of the MCX that I personally have have this little paddle up here with a plus or minus that you can adjust. So if the gun's really dirty and you need a little extra oomph, you can put it on the plus setting and you get more gas but more recoil. And if it's normal or if it's clean or if you're shooting suppressed, you can put it in the minus setting and it works perfectly. It works great with suppressors, so fortunately it's very easy to swap barrels, swap barrel lengths, swap calibers. You can go from a 5 inch 300 blackout like the Rattler to a 16 inch 5.56 with a quick barrel swap and that's all it needs. The barrels also used a tapered muzzle which is optimized for suppressor use. Unlike regular square shoulder designs, it's much easier to achieve 
perfect concentricity and to reduce the possibility of carbon locking your suppressor if you're using a barrel that's got the tapered muzzle. Can you hear that? Those excellent AR-15 ergonomics are all still present with the MCX, which uses the same trigger, the same bolt release and magazine release. It just makes them ambidextrous. Like the AK, the MCX also uses an internal recoil spring, meaning that you can install a folding stock. And with the newer versions of the MCX, you can fold it in either direction, dealer's choice. SIG also offers plenty of options and accessories for the MCX, as do many other third parties. It's already seeing some adoption, and it takes AR-15 magazines, so it's arguably as modular as the AR-15. Hell, this one's got an AR-15 grip on it. I haven't seen any reports or hard data yet on the MCX's reliability or durability against the AK, but SIG does have a 1.2 million view piece of gun porn on their YouTube page where they just screw the shit out of an MCX. They freeze it bury it in mud, they make it watch Titanic, and it doesn't quit. But there's pretty much no data whatsoever in that video or in the description. It's just a bunch of operator dudes pussyfooting around to the soundtrack from Batman Begins or some shit. The MCX was designed to give end users all the familiarity of the AR-15 or the M16 without any compromises, and it does a pretty damn good job of it. SIG can't talk much about it, and I actually have a bunch of interview footage with SIG that I haven't been able to use talking about how the MCX has been selected by numerous special operations units from numerous NATO countries. The MCX just does stuff better than the AR-15. It might be a little bit heavier, and although I haven't done extensive accuracy testing with my MCXs, I'd be surprised if a piston-operated firearm is going to be as accurate as a direct impingement AR-15, but it might be. And even with minor sacrifices, I don't think it's inaccurate to say that the MCX is the AR-15 virtually perfected, and that's why it's number one on the list. I'm going to make a very detailed MCX versus AR-15 video series in the future to see if my experience with these guns hold true. So what'd you guys think of the list? Did I nail it? Did I get all five? I don't think so, and I bet a few of you are going to have some pretty strong opinions disagreeing with my list, and that's cool because this was actually a really difficult list to make. There are a lot of really good 223, 556 rifles out there. These are just five that I love the most, five that I own, I own all of them because I think they're fantastic. So yeah, maybe I've got a little personal bias, but I think I provide you with some pretty solid data in this video. If you disagree, tell me about it in the comments. Maybe we'll do a round two of this video if you guys enjoyed it enough. If you really enjoy it, don't forget to subscribe, Thank you for watching the video. Thank you to our sponsors, Ventura Munitions, the best ammo store anywhere in the world, and to Top Gun Supply, your online shooting sports superstore. Thank you to our Patreon and Subscribestar supporters. We don't take money from manufacturers. SIG didn't pay me to do this. Steyr didn't pay me to do this. I bought all these guns with my own money, and I do it because you guys support TFB, the firearm blog, and TFB TV through our Patreon and our Subscribestar pages. We couldn't do it without you. Thanks again. Take care.